Hey, we are recording. Oh, are we rolling? Let's talk about UPI. If there is a list of technologies that revolutionized India, UPI will surely have its place in that. And in this episode of One Better Time, we're going to look into the logic behind the unified payments interface. Let's rewind back to 2015. If you had to do a bank transfer or make a payment, you had to be physically present in the bank or use internet banking, but that only helped a specific set of people because internet used to be expensive. Fast forward to 2022, from a small roadside shop to a major supermarket chain, from a small business to a major application, UPI is everywhere. UPI or also known as Unified Payments Interface was created by NPCI and was launched on 11th April 2016 by Dr. Raghuram G. Rajan who is the governor at RPI Mumbai. Right now, every bank has its own UPI app, every vendor has its own QR code and there are so many popular apps that we commonly use. Phone Pay, G Pay, Paytm and so many more. So what is UPI and what exactly makes it unique? UPI is a real-time payment system developed by NPCI which allows interbank, peer-to-peer -peer, or peer-to-merchant payments. You can receive and transfer money 24 by 7 throughout the year. You can use one mobile application to make transactions from various banks without any hassle. How does UPI work? Okay, so we get that it makes payments very easy to do through UPI. But what exactly happens once you enter the PIN number and hit pay? Okay, so let's do a deeper dive. There are multiple entities involved in every single transaction. The payer and the receiver PSP or payment service provider. The remitter and the beneficiary bank. The National Payments Corporation of India or NPCI. And finally, you, the account holders and the merchants who you pay to. We understand that there are multiple entities involved in every single transaction, but within every single transaction, there are other components which play a major role. What are they? One, the payment address. A payment address is basically the basic building block of UPI. It is used to uniquely identify a person's account details. So in this architecture, the payment address is provided as account at the rate of provider form. The translation of this payment address happens at an NPCI level. So there are multiple ways in which this address could be written and here are some examples. So now let's get on to the next point which is authentication. Authentication is an important security procedure and in this case I can give you an example of authentication that is pin based or OTP based authentication. And in UPI usually we use a pin based authentication and for every single account you can create a separate pin. Finally authorization. Today, authentication and authorization go hand in hand and follow the same flow. By adopting a third party authentication tool and also using a tokenless payment scheme, banks can actually reduce the overall issuance cost. By this, they can also have the authorization and account management within their control. Okay, let's assume that you wanted to send some money to your friend. You would enter the amount, select the bank from where it needs to be debited and then you enter your UPI PIN. Once you hit send, your bank details will be requested by the UPI network and it will be retrieved from the PSP where it's stored. With the bank details, NPCI sends a debit request to your bank which will then be authenticated and then you receive a debit response. Then, the payee bank receives a credit request after which you get a notification which is the paid response. Once you look at it like this, it seems simple. But how do they make this happen? So now we understood the flow of every transaction in UPI. Let's do a deeper dive and look into the architecture of UPI. So at the very top layer, we have the mobile applications and the third party applications. So these are basically Paytm, PhonePay, ParthPay, Google Pay. There are so many other applications which you can use. So these are at the very top layer. These applications are then connected to the bank accounts. For example, even though you have an application, let's say Google Pay, you won't be able to do any payment or you won't be able to receive any payment if you don't have a bank account connected to it. For the same reason, bank accounts are connected to these applications and also once you enter your details in these applications, let's say Google Pay again, once you enter the details in Google Pay, it has to validate that if it is your account through the banks, right? So for that, there is a bank connection. 
So these two put together is called the payment service provider. So now these banks have their standard interfaces and this standard interface is connected to the UPI, the unified payments interface. So the payment service providers are connected to the UPI and the UPI has its own central repository where all of your details are stored. Your bank account details, your name, your personal details, the merchant details. So whenever a transaction happens, the information is taken from this central repository to validate if the details which you have provided are correct or not. It is not just for UPI, there are other things which you can do. For example, if you want to do an IMPS payment, you can do it through UPI itself. If you want to do a payment through your Rupee card, you can do it through UPI itself. So there are these other branches as well. So this put together makes the architecture of UPI. In the architecture of UPI, we understood these payment applications, which are third party applications like Paytm, PhonePay are connected to UPI. But how exactly is this connection established? So what exactly is used to integrate these payment applications with UPI? So to do this, we use something called the application programming interfaces or APIs. So these APIs are provided by NPCI themselves, which are used by these payment gateway companies to integrate themselves with UPI. In the context of API, application is basically a software with a distinct function and the interface is a contract of service between these two applications and in this case it is the payment gateway application and UPI. All APIs are exposed as a stateless service over HTTPS. So statelessness is a fundamental aspect of the modern internet. So much so that every single day, multiple applications which you use, use these stateless APIs. For example, most requests you make on social media are stateless. To put it very simply, statelessness or stateless APIs are when there need not be any information stored on the server when you are calling that API. So as we discussed earlier, UPI has surely revolutionized the fintech sector of India. But when you talk about online transactions, there are other things which comes into play. There is cryptocurrencies and there is also something called the electronic money. So do you think that UPI will be the future also or will these things take over? So what do you guys think would be the next big thing in the Indian fintech sector? Leave it in the comment section below and for more such insightful content, follow Scalar.